morning. This is Pastor Keith. Welcome to Hollywood Church today. I'm here in my office at uh, my home in Lucama, and this is where I spend a lot of my time now. Uh, so I am like you, a little bit secluded and shut in, and uh, plenty of yard work to do, and I have a plenty of time to spend out here in the study and chance to read and learn about the new things that <clears throat> have to be done to keep um, coming to you, even though we can't be together. So I wanted to wish you good morning and a good Lord's Day and tell you how excited I am that God is uh, providing a way for us to at least keep in contact. It's awkward and different, but we're hoping and praying we're going to get better at it and we're going to see some good things uh, done in our in our church. I want to pray for us uh, right now. Dear Heavenly Father, we come together to ask you to minister to Hollywood Church to fill us with joy that we would grow in our faith as we study Sarah and the some of the matriarchs, the mothers that are so uh, critical in our history. We pray, Lord, for you to give us a happy birthday because it is our church's homecoming day and ordinarily we'd be celebrating and eating together and just hasten the day when we'll be able to return to that. Um, Give us a hunger for you more so, though, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So a couple of things to talk about. Uh, first, have I had questions like, well, what does this COVID-19 uh, mean? And is uh, about the second wave, what, what does it all mean? Well, theologically and biblically, it's very important to understand that <clears throat> usually this is God's way of getting a culture's attention. If you read Amos chapter 1, you'll find a very rhetorical um, message there where he asks the uh, the people um, to consider their own sins. And he talks about different levels of incremental discipline that God was bringing against Israel and Judah. And he says, I sent this to you and you didn't listen. I sent this to you and you didn't listen. I sent this and on and on it goes. And then he says, and because you have not paid attention, uh, prepare to meet your God. That's in Amos chapter 4, verse 12. It's a very interesting reminder to us that God expects people to turn to Him. And I look at this uh, response of the United States and the world, and all of us are looking to a vaccination. We're looking to our own selves instead of looking to the Lord. And I would like to say it's kind of an ignorant thing for us to think or imagine that this is the first time this sort of thing has happened. If you want to do some real interesting reading, you should go back and read about the Black Plague and see how the church responded to that. That was uh, extraordinary. I think 500 million people died. And the church had, uh, they had quarantine uh, restrictions as well during that time. And people were so... Well, it was really an extraordinary event. Uh, and we, all of us, need to be evaluating how we're going to respond in the midst of this ongoing dilemma. We need prayer and wisdom. We ask you to pray for the elders of our church, the leadership, the session, so that we might um, be able to discern God's will. And also, we hope that you'll pray for the staff as we try to implement the mission and the vision of our church as we move forward. We thank you and hope that you keep in contact with us. God bless you. We'll look forward to seeing you soon.
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. that I face stronger than the power of the grave constant in the trial and the change one thing remains one thing remains he love never fails Never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up. Never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up. Never runs out on me. And on and on and on and on it goes. For it overwhelms and satisfies my soul. And I never ever have to be afraid One thing remains Your love never fails and never gives up And never runs out on me Your love never fails and never gives up And never runs out on me Your love never fails and never gives up And never runs out on me Your love In death, in life, I'm confident and covered by the power of your great love. My debt is paid, there's nothing that can separate my heart from your great love. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up. Never runs out on me. The love never fails and never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love. Your love never fails and never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love. Good morning, and welcome to Hollywood Church's Time with the Children. This morning, we will be learning from the book, Big Book of Animal Devotions. This is a great book that has lots of information about different animals, and so if your child really likes to learn about animals, this would be a great devotion to add to your family library. Today, we are going to be doing the devotion called Bugs with Flashlights. Our scripture reading for today comes from Matthew 5.16. 
In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. We used to catch them in glass jars. When we had a half dozen or more, it looked like a lantern. The light given off by fireflies in the jar was enough to read by. In the late spring and summer, they filled our backyards. When we held them against our finger, we felt a little heat each time they flashed. At the time, the flashes didn't mean anything to us, but each one meant a great deal to the fireflies. Actually, they are beetles. They are sending out message to flies that they could mate with. The male might hold his light on for half a second and the female sends back a flash. If the flashes are not timed correctly, the fireflies stay away. Sometimes a firefly might hold a flash for too long or wait too long to send it. The result may send it to the wrong insect. Because its signals were off, it might be eaten by a stranger. It is possible that some types send out the wrong signals on purpose. They aren't looking for a mate, just dinner. Many of us call the firefly a glow worm. They are easy to confuse since there are 2,000 types of bugs with lanterns on their tails. The firefly can control its light. A substance that can burn fills the firefly's tail section. When air gets to this section, it starts a small fire. The firefly can hold the substance back or push it forward. That is why fireflies are sometimes hard to catch. They simply turn off their lights. The air is breathed in so the firefly can stop the signal whenever it wants to. In the winter, fireflies become coal miners. They dig in to the top of the soil to escape the cold. If we were to dig them up, we might find their lamps still lit. They could be getting heat from their lanterns. Fireflies are used for beauty and light. In other countries, some women wear them on their dresses or as jewelry. Men who have had to travel in the dark often make lanterns from them or put them on their boots to light their paths. That's pretty cool. The fireflies will become excited and light more often. In some ways, you are like a firefly. Jesus told us to let our light shine before men. When people see our good behavior, we are like a light shining in darkness. When they see this light, they can then see the God we serve. Like fireflies, we control our light. We can make it shine as much as we want to. Right now, we can still be a light to those around us. Even though we're not able to go out to public places very much, you can still think about your friends and family or members of the church that you haven't seen in a while and do something special for them to let them know that God's light is still shining strong. I gave the youth a challenge this week and I asked them to send a card or a little special note or maybe even a phone call to one of the elderly people in our church. That's something that you can do too. It doesn't have to be to someone in our church. It can be a friend that you haven't seen in a while, um, a grandparent or a family member, or maybe a neighbor. So this week, I would love for you to think of how you can share God's light to those around you during this time. You never know how much your little thoughtful action can really affect someone in a big way. Let's say a prayer to end our time. God, we thank you so much for fireflies and how fun they are to catch and play with in the summer, Lord. But most of all, we thank you for the way that they remind us about your light in the darkness, Lord. I pray that you will help all of us that this week we will be able to share your light with someone else, Father. Give us a, an idea or a way that you desire for us to reach out, and I pray that you will put someone special in our hearts, Lord that we can reach out to and share your love and your light with, Father. 
Bless all the families of Hollywood Church and everyone watching today, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, you all have a good week, and I'll see you next time. This world is not my home, I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere behind the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have a friend like you. If heaven's not my home, oh Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. church on what would be our homecoming Sunday. It's, uh, it's not a typical year for us, is it? But it's our 77th birthday uh, in the month of May. Our church uh, began in uh, May the 9th of 1943. So we are thanking God for his kindness to us. The, the age of the church reminds me a little bit of the story of Abraham. And so does uh, the story of Sarah. And actually, it's what we're going to be studying this morning is Sarah. And for the next five weeks, actually, we're going to be studying some interesting moms in the book of Genesis, mothers. Now, the reason why it reminds me of Hollywood is because uh, our church is, uh, we had our 75th anniversary just recently, and Abraham was 75 years old. When the Lord came to him and told him that he was going to be the father uh, of a multitude of people. And Sarah, uh, his wife of 10 years younger, 65, uh, was, uh, was childless and was unable to bear any children. And so the, the promise that God made with them came to them in their old age. And I have always felt that Hollywood Church is an Abraham church, meaning that God is coming to us 
in our older uh, age because we're going to birth some new things. And I feel like God's been saying that to our church. But the second thing is the story of Sarah is quite interesting because she, um, she, had a tr she had trouble believing through the process. It was not easy. She made some mistakes. We'll look a little bit at that this morning. But um, Sarah, being the mother, reminds me of Hollywood in the fact that mothers has always been, uh, mothers have always been a very important focus of Hollywood church. When I came to Hollywood, we began to try to discern the vision for our church, what we were going to do and how we would move forward. And one of the clear things to us was uh, our intent to focus on moms and music. So the moms comes out of the fact that our church really began on Mother's Day. I thought that was quite interesting in 1943. And so ever since then, our church has had this focus on moms. And even to the day, we still are very interested in helping mothers. And we do that through our baby pantry. We do that through our mom's ministries, which stands for Mothers of Many Seasons, moms. Uh, we, we try to help and encourage the family as much as we can. So there you go. That's why we're where we are. I felt last December when I was planning out the year of preaching that we should take the month of May to talk about matriarchs. So May and matriarchs. So we'll talk about that. Let's pray a little bit. Let me say this first before we do. I uh, thank you for continuing to support Hollywood Church. Our offerings are down a little because, of course, we don't have the cash coming in that we did at once. But I do appreciate all of you who are helping us financially, and I'd like to encourage you to continue to support your church in prayer and to support your church financially. Let's pray together. Our Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus, we ask for the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts through the story of Sarah. May our minds be filled with good things and our hearts be nourished with your truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now I'm going to read just a little scripture uh, from Genesis chapter 17 and again from Genesis chapter 21. The story of Sarah, the full story, is in Genesis, the last part of chapter 11 all the way through chapter 23. Uh, she, of course, came from Ur of the Chaldees into what we call the promised land with Abram on their journey, uh, and that began their faith journey. We're going to pick up the story, though, when God comes to Sarah after she's had a lapse of faith and implored her handmaid, Hagar, to, um, to become a surrogate mother. And so Sarah uh, used Hagar's body so that she could have a child through her and it turned out to be a really really big big mistake so we pick up the story when god comes to reassure sarah she is going to have a child she was uh 90 years old by the way when this baby was born so this would have been about when she was about 89. as for sarah your wife you shall not call her name sarah but sarah shall be her name the difference between those two names is Sarai means Jehovah or the Lord Yahweh is prince and Sarah means princess. So it's just a slight change, but the important thing about that change is that the focus of God's attention was being put on her. He was saying, I am your prince, but you are my princess. This was an awesome moment in Sarah's life when God says this to Abraham. He calls her princess. But Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her. And moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her. And she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. But God said, No, but Sarah... Your wife shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. Later in chapter 18, 
God comes to visit Abraham through uh, what we would uh, call a kind of a pre-incarnate appearance through some angelic beings. And in this story, God seeks out Sarah as he wants to talk to her and reassure her that his promise is about to be fulfilled. So we pick up the story in chapter 18, verse 9. God says to Abraham, where is Sarah your wife? And he said, she is in the tent. The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah your wife shall have, your wife shall have a son. Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. Now that is a simple and poetic way of saying that she was postmenopausal. So she was physically, literally unable to bear a child any other way except through the supernatural intervention of God. So when God says this to Abraham, um, Sarah laughed to herself saying, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Now we're gonna fast forward one more time and we'll have all of the scripture story. We're in chapter 21. The Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore Isaac, which means laughter. What an incredible story. Now, there's so many things about it that I like to talk about. Let me, first of all, share with you the fact that this was not an easy experience for Sarah. She had to learn through a long process of waiting on the Lord. And that is always a difficult thing. You know, Tom Petty had a song that <laughs> talks about that. The waiting is the hardest part, and sometimes it truly is. When you, when you read the Bible, though, you find that God requires waiting quite often. I don't know if you know this or not, but when the Lord told Noah to go into the ark, it didn't just start raining. It didn't start raining for a while. I mean, it took over a week that before it ever started raining. You had to wait. And then after the rain stopped, he had to stay in the ark. He stayed in that ark for 377 days waiting for uh, to be released. I'm quite sure he had his fill of animals after that. You know, Abraham had to wait 25 years for Isaac, actually 24. Jacob had to wait seven years for Rachel and then seven more years because of Laban's trickery. You know, Moses had to wait 40 years in the wilderness. God calls us to have to wait. And so when we get to the story of Sarah, we are reminded that the Lord does not always fulfill his promises to us immediately. This is something that we all have to learn how to wait upon the Lord. Now, Sarah was not only a waiting person, but she became a little bit impatient. Now, one of the things about Sarah that is quite often spoken of is her beauty. She was a beautiful woman. Moses tells us in the in the uh, Pentateuch several times of her beauty. As a matter of fact, it became a snare to her. Her beauty was such that uh, it caused her some problems. I can identify with that. <laughs> and I can identify with the fact that she still had problems with, uh, with people looking at her and thinking she was beautiful even in her old age. Um, but she did. I don't know how she did it, but even in the time that she was 75 years and above, she was, uh, she was longed for by one of the kings in Abraham's contemporary uh, world. And so she was an attractive woman. She was extraordinarily, um, I would say, maybe um, appealing. Now, but she had perhaps, because of that, a little bit of precociousness. You know, she, her family was, was pretty well-to-do. You can study about Abraham's wealth in Genesis 12 all the way through chapter 18 and 19. You'll find that he had a host of servants and lots and lots of wealth. So Sarah was one of those people who had it all. She had beauty, she had money, and she became perhaps impatient, and that 
precociousness and that impatience worked against her to where she schemed instead of waited upon the Lord as she should have. This scheming was something that, that led her down a bumpy road. I, I do like what Vance Havner said about this. He said, the detour is always worse than the main road. And Sarah surely learned this when she gave Hagar over to Abraham to, uh, to mother a child on her behalf. So we get through this period of waiting and this period of precociousness and impatience, and we see God doing something in her. And so what happens next in the text that we read is extraordinarily important and significant because it's God giving her a new name. She moved from Sarai to Sarah because God wanted her to know how she was in his eyes. She was a princess. Now, she didn't have any children. She didn't, she, she was longing in her heart for something. And maybe she didn't realize it at the time, but what she was really longing for the most was that affirmation that came from God. It's an incredible thing that all of us, when we come to Jesus, according to the book of Revelation, we are given a new name. We don't even know what that name is. We'll learn that when we're in the presence of God. But it's an affectionate thing when God gives us a new name. And when he gave this name to Sarah, it was because of his love for her and his, and his concern for her faith. So he's nurturing her faith. He's helping her, and he gives this new name through Abraham to her of Sarah, and then he reassures her of his promise. Now, all of us need this, by the way, don't we? Now, aren't there times when we just need to be reassured of God's love for us and his promises to us? That's why we have the Bible. That's why we study the Bible together. That's why we read the Bible together, because all of us, like Sarah, are empty. We're longing, we're barren apart from God coming to us and speaking to us. And he, he comes to Sarah, he gives this new name to her. Even after she had made this lapse of judgment and had fallen in her faith and done something that was really going to affect the whole course of history because she was so impulsive and impatient. But when God comes to her and gives her this new name, he takes her onto a journey, the next level of that journey, which is going to be one that gives birth to great joy and great laughter. I will, I will say that this is, this is like God. We, we usually have to go through the trial and the hardship before we realize how much God cares about us in our pain, how much God does not pay attention to that mistake that we made or that problem that we had or that lapse but he himself looks forward to the future have you noticed how god doesn't talk to sarah about her past but he keeps reminding her about her future that's a word there for you god wants you to look at your future forget about all of that stuff it's gone put it in the rearview mirror let it get smaller as you go along and keep looking forward for Sarah, it was to have a child. Now, when God reassured her, she broke out into laughter. That was because it was almost a, an incredible thing. But God, after hearing her laugh, he confronts her with it in a kind of a gentle way. And then he asked the question in Genesis 18, 19. He said, is there anything too hard for God? Of course not. So God kept his promise. And Isaac was born this was when she was 90 years old, over 90 years old. Abraham, over 100 years old. We're talking about a couple that when this baby was born, their sorrow turned into laughter and joy, and they, they named their child Isaac because of that. Do you know that's what God does is uh, he gives us joy. He gives us happiness in our heart above everything else. And here, here's the way it comes. It comes when we believe God, when we follow God, when we trust God, when we wait on God, when we rehearse the promises of God, when we recite those promises and, and, we, and we 
wait for the Lord to keep his word to us that he's going to bring some good things. This is God's word for you today. I will tell you that Sarah died. Of course, you know that. But she, she died with joy. And when she died, what the Bible tells about her is important about her motherhood. We learn in Genesis chapter 23 that Sarah was 127 years old. That means that she had 37 years of joy with her child. And she was a great mother. We, we know that because we get into Genesis 24 and we read that Isaac was incredibly grief-stricken because of his mother's death. Uh, he, he himself struggled with his mother's death until he found his wife, Rebecca, who helped to comfort him. That tells me that Isaac mourned her for years and years. Maybe today you are mourning the loss of your mom or maybe one of your parents. I'd like to reassure you that God sees and God knows and God helps. One of the things that happened in Genesis 23 in the story of Sarah's burial is that Abraham and Isaac were there and they were grieving. There, there were tears shed over Sarah's death. She had accompanied her husband in his pursuit of God for 87 years. She had been 40 years old when they left their comfortable surroundings in Ur. She had been approaching her 80s when she made that bad decision to mother a child through Hagar. And she had been 90 when her son Isaac was born. And she had been a mama for 37 years. Now I want to tell you, the thing that happens next is... God's estimation of her is told after her death like in an obituary. For example, from Moses, he tells us about her and from Peter in the New Testament, he explains about her appearance in 1 Peter in the, in the uh, third chapter that, uh, that she had an inner radiant beauty. In other words, God, when he gave her the name Sarah, she went from that precociousness to that comfortable resting faith. And it was so becoming on her that she had that outward beauty and that inward beauty that made her a remarkable mother for 37 years. Peter presents her as a good example for Christian wives to follow. She had a gentle and a quiet spirit and she was not a woman given over to fear. That's what Peter tells us. And then just so you'll know, Paul talks about her in Galatians. In the fourth chapter, he calls her the free woman, and he uses her as an illustration of grace. And then in the book of Hebrews, in the 11th chapter, she is held up as a hall of famer, one of those people whose faith was so remarkable that she gets the mention of of the, 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 the honored, those who deserve esteem because they went and walked by faith. So today I'd like to encourage you to believe God like Sarah, to work through your past failures, to wait on the Lord, to trust him, to believe that God is with you and that his promises will be fulfilled. Thank you so much for joining us at Hollywood Church. God bless you. Amen.